Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive, and I'm here with Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins as we give you the first of our two Westchester coronavirus updates for this week. It is Monday, April 19th. We are now uh, in the 15th month of uh, dealing with this crisis, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing the numbers uh, as they stand today getting better each day. Hopefully, we'll start to move to a period where the infections drop dramatically as our vaccinations increase. Uh, we're going to have Mayor Noam Bramson on in a few minutes. We'll also be joined by Martha Lopez, who is both a councilwoman in New Rochelle and uh, an important member of our team as a direct program and policy. And we'll talk about a few other different things, and then we'll cover some issues that are non-COVID related, but uh, at the top of our agenda here in the county government. First of all, the numbers, the New York State tracker is up as of uh, today, and uh, it shows that there's 125,913 total positives pandemic to date. The very good news is, given the number of positives from two weeks ago, we now have 4,110 active cases, and that number is a continuation of uh, the decrease that we've seen now over the last two weeks. Went through a period where we had drops for about seven straight weeks after our peak in uh, the middle part of January, then it flattened out for a few weeks, and now it's starting to drop again. Uh, a week ago today, we were at 5,128 active cases, and two weeks ago, we were at 5,868 active cases. So we're now back to seeing a steady decline in the amount of infections countywide. That's on the basis of 2.6 million tests that have occurred in Westchester County. So it's not a dropping number because we're not testing. The testing continues to be robust and across the board in the various communities. Um, we're also very happy to see that our hospitalization numbers now have been dropping dramatically as well. The last number we has, have is as of Saturday, where we had 150 people hospitalized for COVID. The week before, that number was 192. And the week before that, uh, we had 238 people that were uh, hospitalized. So we've gone from 238 down to 150 in the last two weeks. And if you go back to that mid-January peak, we were almost 600 individuals. We're now down to 150. So clearly, that is a significant drop, three quarters lower than where we were in our peak of January. And at 150, at a steady drop, that may reflect that uh, the, the, va the vaccinations are making less severe those cases that occur. And that means less likely that you'd wind up in the hospital and, of course, less likely that you'd suffer fatality. We have lost uh, pandemic to date 2,246 Westchester residents. Over the last week, we have lost uh, 12 individuals, and that number is the lowest that we've seen in uh, quite a while for a weekly total. Uh, in recent weeks prior, prior, we were around 20 and then in the mid-20s and higher. Uh, I always caution to say immediately, even one death is one death too many. It's a personal loss to people that matter. Uh, the loved ones of the individuals that died, but we look for trend lines and a lower trend in active cases, a lower trend in hospitalizations, and a lower trend in fatality all points to something very positive happening. You're hearing different things in different parts of the country. I speak for what we know in terms of Westchester County, and uh, certainly the efforts here uh, go back right to the very beginning of the pandemic. And uh, from our standpoint, we're hopeful that the numbers continue to move in that direction. We're encouraged by the number of vaccinations that we've had in Westchester County. According to New York State statistics, 32% of all people in Westchester County have been fully vaccinated against coronavirus. Almost one out of every three people fully vaccinated, uh, and uh, whether it's a two-dose or in those cases of Johnson & Johnson, a one-dose treatment. We have an additional 14% that gets us up to 46% uh, of the people who have had at least one vaccine dose. So they're awaiting their second dose. We assume that will happen either in the three to four week period of time. And at that point in time, which would be uh, somewhere in uh, the early part of May, we will reach 46% of the population vaccinated with more that would have then been one shot by then, uh, approaching to exceed the 50% mark, which is very encouraging. Of course, the opening of vaccinations uh, two weeks ago to those uh, from the age of 16 up and three weeks ago to those 30 years of old, it really opened up the eligibility. And it's the open eligibility and the greater supply that we have that's made the difference of the number of people vaccinated. Uh, at our clinics, which are the, the largest single source of uh, vaccinations. We have, in the aggregate, 288,000 vaccines that have been administered. We're approaching the 300,000 mark. And the Westchester County Center, which has been the central uh, place for vaccinations in the county, and we vaccinate people from elsewhere, not just Westchester, at that location, uh, today we will reach the 200,000 vaccination mark, uh, which shows a real commitment to vaccinating the, uh, the, the vast population, not just of our county, but of other places. Uh, the, the center opened in January. It operates seven days 
days a week, 11 hours a day, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., and it's reached over 2,000 a day now. It started out about 1,000 a day, and that is by far and away the greatest amount of concentration of vaccinations. The Yonkers Armory is the second largest facility. It's been open a lot less uh, in time, probably slightly over a month. Uh, 46,000 vaccinations given out at the Yonkers Armory. That is a partnership of the state and FEMA. And then Westchester County operates two clinics, uh, our regular White Plains Clinic here in downtown White Plains on Court Street, and then uh, one that we set up at the gymnasium at uh, the Westchester Community College on the Greenberg Mount Pleasant border. Uh, and the combination of those two clinics has vaccinated 43,000, 43,566 to be specific, over the course of both um, of those facilities over the course of the time of the pandemic. So in the aggregate, 288,000 plus vaccinations given out in the major locations. That doesn't count all of the pharmacies that have had allocations going back to uh, January. That doesn't count the various satellite or pop-up facilities that have happened. We've had them all over the place. The state has had a number of, um, of these uh, pop-up centers. Now the county has been able to do them as well. We had uh, two days in Port Chester last week. Uh, earlier in the week, we had one in Bedford. Uh, uh, the prior weekend, there was a satellite uh, spot at uh, one of the churches in White Plains, and we will continue to have more of those as we have vaccines available. The vaccines have been more plentiful. Uh, they're not yet universal. But uh, we're at a point now where if uh, an individual wants to get a shot, it is much, much easier than it was at the outset of the vaccine availability to get a shot. And uh, right now, with the Johnson & Johnson pause, uh, we are still uh, administering Pfizer and Moderna, two-shot vaccines, and uh, they continue to uh, provide the bulk of the protection for folks. Ken will chat about this in just a little bit. But we're encouraged that the amount of vaccines now have started to reach a significant amount of the population, again, approaching 50 percent of the people that have been uh, vaccinated here in Westchester County, at least with one dose and more coming. And of course, there may be later in the year booster shots that are required. We'll see how that all works out. We'll follow whatever the science is and whatever the CDC and the New York State Department of Health uh, provides us. I'm going to ask Ken Jenkins, uh, our Deputy County Executive, just to talk to us briefly about vaccine appointments in light of uh, what we're talking about. Thanks, George. And, and as the county executive just pointed out, the, Jack, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine continues to be on pause. Um, there's an expectation that the CDC will be meeting later on this week um, to make some decisions about maybe some modifications in administration. We'll all just wait to see. But with that, it still continues to be a race, as, as George has pointed out many times, between the virus and the vaccinations. And the vaccine appointments are available. Um, the ones that you see normally on the Am I Eligible um, website, that's the New York State sites, the ones in partnership with FEMA, the ones that New York State does on its own, um, the mass vaccination sites at the county center. Um, this weekend, there were actually appointments at the county center on the same day. So there are very, very many appointments that are available. That doesn't count the ones, as um, the county executive pointed out, the ones that work out of the Westchester Community College or here on um, Court Street here in White Plains, which come up on the health.westchestergov.com website. And those appointments are available as well. Um, as the county executive pointed out, the vaccine um, availability continues to increase. At the same time, the, the availability is there for everyone. So make sure to take that opportunity to get vaccinated, to get to a site. Um, even though the, the one shot dosage of uh, Johnson & Johnson's on pause, the best vaccination is the one you could get right now. And both Pfizer and Moderna are available now. Please go to those websites and get vaccinated. Do it today. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Ken. So um, uh, as we uh, get ready to show the progress that we've made, it, it is always uh, common for us to look back. And uh, over the last month, month of March, where we had a one-year anniversary of the start of the pandemic, uh, I think of interacting with the mayor of New Rochelle in those days, Noam Bramson. The first uh, public outbreak occurred in New Rochelle. Now, we believe that the virus now was already in this area well before that. Uh, people had it, uh, weren't detected, there were no testing for it yet. You may remember the very early stages uh, in March, uh, there was only one place in the country that, that a test for COVID could be processed, the central one in, uh, in the federal government under the CDC control. Then they allowed in mid-March one facility in New York State to have it. It's, it's uh, very different from what we have now. There's so many different testing centers. But in that initial outbreak, uh, 
those who uh, tried to figure out what do we do next um, thought about it in a very general way. Uh, the city of New Rochelle thought about it in a very specific way because that's where the first number of uh, positive tests came. And so Mayor Noam Bramson from that point in time to today, uh, as with all of our municipal officials, has been a good partner. We've tried to be helpful uh, to the city in every way we can. We most recently did uh, a satellite uh, pop-up uh, vaccination center for the New Rochelle Housing Authority. Uh, we also saw that they had another vaccination center that was at the, the New Rochelle Public Library. Uh, the state's involved in that. State's also involved in one that was done over at uh, Hope Community Services a few weeks ago. So the efforts being made to try to deal with every corner of the county, and in this place, uh, the second largest city in the county, New Rochelle, uh, and uh, their population. So I'd like to ask uh, Mayor Noam Bramson to come, give us an update on what's happening in New Rochelle. And Mr. Mayor, so far? So good. Getting better. Thank you very much, George. I, I appreciate the introduction. And um, you're certainly right that those early days of the pandemic are, are really seared into our memories and probably will be for the rest of our lives. I remember being in this very room. It was configured differently at the time, but uh, sitting with uh, you and your team as we confronted what we knew would be um, uh, a completely life-altering experience for, uh, for our community and for our entire region. Uh, from that very first day and in all the days since, uh, I've been enormously grateful for your, your partnership, your leadership, uh, the Deputy County Executive as well. Uh, and as long as I'm uh, distributing praise, let me also note uh, my colleague Martha Lopez, who we're going to hear from in just a short while, who of course has vital countywide responsibilities, but also wears another hat as a member of the New Rochelle City Council and has been a force of nature. Uh, in advocating for, especially for portions of our community that have been traditionally marginalized, uh, never more so than during, uh, during this pandemic. Uh, conditions in New Rochelle, just as they have been around the county, uh, have been steadily improving since the beginning of the year. Uh, we are down to fewer than 400 active cases. Of course, that is uh, too many, but a significant decline from what we experienced just a few weeks ago. And it's no coincidence that active cases are declining just as vaccination rates uh, continue to increase. Um, and so we are pleased that uh, vaccinations are easier to come by. Uh, we're glad that our local hospital, Montefiore New Rochelle, has had its vaccination privileges restored. Uh, there are multiple pharmacies uh, within our community that are offering the vaccine on a regular basis. And of course, just as people outside our community can come into New Rochelle to get vaccinated, people within New Rochelle can go elsewhere. Uh, my own mother was vaccinated at the Westchester County Center. So this is most appropriately thought of as a, a regional and even national exercise, one in which we don't live within silos of uh, little uh, villages and towns and cities. We have to think of ourselves as, as all in this together. But to the extent that we can focus our pop-ups, as you noted, uh, County Executive, on populations that may have difficulty traveling or may have difficulty navigating the portals through which you make vaccina vaccination appointments, uh, we really want to make sure that we're reaching everyone. And so when we have had pop-ups, we've worked hand in glove with our local not-for-profits that uh, have the best relationships with vulnerable residents to make sure that those uh, vaccines are delivered where they are needed most. And between the pop-ups that we've organized uh, with county and state officials, we've uh, delivered more than 1,500 doses of the vaccine, um, which uh, has been, of course, enormously helpful uh, to our city. Uh, the last thing I, I, I want to note is that I think all of us believe we are fast approaching and may even have arrived at an inflection point at which it's no longer vaccine supply that's going to be the critical constraint, but rather vaccine demand. Uh, we all know anecdotally from conversations that we have with friends and neighbors, and we know from reading the news that there are many people who, despite the enormous weight of scientific and medical evidence, are still reluctant to get the vaccine. And look, I get it. We are living at a time when many people are skeptical of pronouncements from the government, skeptical of the pronouncements of particular government officials. Uh, we can debate why that is the case, but for the purpose of this conversation, we should simply accept it as a fact. And so my appeal to those who are uncertain about taking the vaccine is don't take my word for it. Don't take their word for it. Talk to your own doctor. Talk to your own care provider. Have a quiet conversation and draw upon their knowledge and their experience. Talk to friends and relatives who themselves have gotten the vaccine 
and, and hear from them what their experience was like and the sense of liberation that comes after getting the vaccine that you can once again participate in normal life without feeling like your own health is at risk or without putting the health of others at risk. And of course, it's not just about individualized impacts. Getting the vaccine is also an act of civic patriotism because we cannot fully overcome this virus unless all of us are working together to make sure we get to herd immunity. So I hope that message will be propagated by, by everyone. It'll be heard loud and clear. There's no question we are moving in the right direction. Things are getting better. We have more work to do, but I'm very optimistic that as the year draws on, uh, we will make it out of the tunnel and into a new and brighter day. And uh, I thank you again for your extraordinary leadership. Um, it means a great deal to the people of New Rochelle and to all the people of Westchester. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I just want to highlight that uh, there is some good news on the front that the mayor has been a very strong advocate for, not only the mayor, but Councilwoman Lopez, uh, Councilman Al Tarantino, members of the New Rochelle City Council, and the county legislators who represent New Rochelle, uh, Damon Marr, Terry Clements, particularly Catherine Parker. Uh, we have been working with the state of New York to encourage them to um, uh, return Glen Island to uh, county control for the recreational benefit that it represents. Uh, they have already made, as you know, a, a willingness to open up Glen Island so that a certain number of cars can go down there and people can walk about the park. Uh, we're hoping that in the next uh, week to two weeks, three weeks, that they will make a decision that will allow us to regain full control of Glen Island. And for that, Mr. Mayor, your advocacy and uh, Martha, your colleagues on the council and the county legislators were really pivotal in that. Decision hasn't been finalized yet. We're hopeful. Uh, we approach the state in a respectful fashion. The amount of testing is now um, uh, widespread in, in every possible venue. And what the Glen Island Testing Center represented at the outset was the first real opportunity for us to have mass testing in the same way that the county center was the first place to have mass vaccinations. In both cases, the county government took significant assets took them offline and provided them to the state to provide the necessary testing in that situation and still to this day vaccinations uh, in White Plains. But uh, hopefully we'll get some very good news from the state soon. When we do, we'll have a nice announcement. We'll come down to your shop. We'll make the announcement in New Rochelle. I'm hopeful that'll be the case. And I think for all the people that have waited to see Glen Island come back to uh, citizen use, that that is a very big potential on the horizon. We've already instructed the Parks Department to begin the planning process of how we would open the beach if we get the authority to do so. We have not gotten that authority yet, but we're hopeful that we will. Uh, Glen Island is the largest of the three county beaches. We opened two of them last year in Playland and Croton Point Park. I'll mention more about that in just a little bit. It would be wonderful if we can get Glen Island back online, and that would be very good news for New Rochelle. So thank you for your advocacy, Mr. Mayor, and the council, and the county legislators, and we'll hope for the best on that score. Um, as, as Ken pointed out and, and Noam highlighted again, uh, we're dealing now on the cusp of what will probably be our major public policy task over the next uh, 90 days, 120 days, perhaps for as long uh, as the rest of the year extends, and that is to try to go from the uh, percentages of vaccination that will probably be somewhere in the 60 percentile range of those who, who are comfortable taking the vaccine, we're not quite there yet, but we're moving in that direction, and try to reach now an additional 20, 30 percent of people that have been hesitant to do so. One of the things we're trying to do is to reach out to the Spanish-speaking community here in Westchester County. There has clearly been a greater reticence to uh, take the vaccine in uh, communities of color, uh, where there's greater poverty. In some cases, uh, there is not necessarily a, a connection to the health care delivery network, very hard to do in the poorest parts of this county, and the added barrier of language that exists if your native language is Spanish or any other language uh, here in, in an English-speaking country. So we want to reduce the hesitancy in those underserved communities, let people know that the vaccine is safe and effective. I've taken it, and Ken has taken it, we've all taken it, uh, and certainly we're, we've taken no more or less risk than anybody else in the society has, those that have taken it. But uh, we're trying now to reach out to that Spanish-speaking community. And with that thought in mind, I'd like to ask Martha Lopez to join us here. Uh, and then uh, we will have an opportunity to see a video that's been prepared uh, through Sun River and Peekskill in this PSA campaign. But first, uh, Martha Lopez, who by day is a county official and after hours represents the first uh, city council district in New Rochelle. Thank you so much. Thank you for the executive. 
well, I couldn't hold on. Hold on. Okay. My apologies. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, County Executive, Deputy County Executive, and our Mayor of New Rochelle. And as they all said how important it is to get the vaccine, and we're almost getting there. However, we're not quite there yet. To my brothers and sisters, my Latino brothers and sisters, I'd like to say something to you in Spanish. Por mucho tiempo hemos estado tomando las vacunas. Esto es muy importante. Yo me he vacunado. Sin embargo, todavía nos falta mucho trabajo. Todavía tenemos muchas personas que no tienen la vacuna. ¿Por qué es importante que nos vacunemos? Porque nos importa nuestra comunidad, porque nos importan nuestros niños, porque nos importan nuestros padres y nuestros vecinos. Como se ha dicho antes, todavía hay mucha gente que no se ha vacunado. Tenemos varios lugares, tenemos lugares donde se han dado la vacuna, ya sea en New Rochelle, en el condado de Westchester, en el Community College de Valhalla y también en el County Center en White Plains. Por favor, le pedimos, hagan la cita, pónganse en contacto con nosotros, llámenos al 914-995-2900 o llámeme a mí. Muchas personas continúan llamándonos, pregunten por las citas. Estamos aquí para ustedes, pero no lo podemos hacer solos. Necesitamos la ayuda de todos ustedes. Así que con la ayuda de nuestro ejecutivo, de nuestro sub ejecutivo y de nuestro alcalde, sé que podemos llegar a ese lugar donde nos sentamos, estemos dispuestos a decir que estamos todos muy bien y que estamos bien de salud. Así que por favor, por favor, llámenos, vacúnense para que todos podamos estar bien de salud. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you again. Thank you, Marla. And to reinforce that message, uh, we have a video that's been prepared, also in Spanish, and we're going to show that now so you have an idea of how we're trying to reach out to the Spanish-speaking community to overcome any of these objections and try to get more of our uh, uh, fellow residents vaccinated properly. Hola, soy Wilfredo Morel, director de Servicio Médico para los Hispanos en Sun River. Pero a veces también soy conocido como Wilfredo, el líder en la comunidad, o Wilfredo, el escultor. Hoy día soy Wilfredo, el que tomó la vacuna de COVID. Muy importante de que tú, para proteger a tu familia, protegerte tú, tome la vacuna del COVID. Recuérdate que el 98% es preventivo para el COVID. Y además, no te da COVID. Es algo que es para protegerte a ti, proteger a tu familia y proteger a nuestra comunidad. Además de eso, el tomar la vacuna es gratis. Comunícate con tu doctor, comunícate con tu centro de salud para que puedas tomarlo o para que ellos te den más novedades acerca de eso. Vacúnate. Yo lo hice. Gracias. And of course, our mission is to try to reach those individuals for whom Spanish is their primary language or their, their first language uh, to deliver a message for public health and public safety about vaccination. So thank you again, Martha, and uh, the video you saw. Uh, we are prepared to provide videos in any language where we feel there's a concentration of uh, those who speak a, a, another language, and we'll do it in that language to try to reach that constituency, if that makes sense. Je parle français, je parle un peu, mais je ne parle pas bien. I don't know how big the French community is here, but we'll do whatever we have to do to try to communicate to our people so that everybody can be vaccinated. That's the purpose behind us here. Um, we want to highlight that we have been working not only with municipal governments, uh, as we show not only by the Mayor Bramson's visit here today, but by the continual visits that we have of village mayors, city mayors, and town supervisors, but also with our school districts. We have a weekly call with our school districts on Monday morning, as we have an afternoon call with uh, municipal governments uh, every Monday afternoon. In both cases, we're trying to show that the county government is a partner, not a separate corporate interest with its interests, but rather that we are all sibling governments trying to work through the different mandates and things that come down from the state. In this particular case, uh, we try to help provide to schools some of the resources they need. Some of it is technical resources that come out of our Department of Health. Uh, people from Dr. Amler, Rene Recchia, Dr. Uh, Hewlett, and, and Dr. Wang, and others to be able to help the schools organize themselves around the prov provisos from the state uh, for healthy social distancing and so forth, and then sometimes to provide uh, very simply uh, 
uh, personal protective equipment, PPE material, sanitizing uh, liquids and things that would be helpful to them. Uh, we did that uh, today in a brief stop. Lisa Reyes and myself were at Harrison uh, with Dr. Lou Wall, the superintendent of the Harrison schools, where we dropped off some PPE. We had actually a larger amount that was delivered than what's shown in the photograph. But uh, it is an effort to try to reach out and help the school districts also with their mission. And right now, we all want our children to be in school. We want them to be in school. That's the best possible environment for their learning. It is difficult to do that, and we have to be prepared to deal with any outbreaks that may come. But so far, the, uh, the track record in schools have been very good. We opened up high-risk sports a few months ago when uh, the governor gave the authority to counties uh, to be able to do that. We worked through that relatively quickly. And on board and now hopefully uh, with schools that are back uh, in the classroom setting. Uh, we have some distribution that's coming up to the Leffel School, Westchester Torah Academy and Westchester Day School, the Yorktown Central School District, the Ossining Union Free District, the Henrik Hudson School District. They will all be recipients of PPE in the next few days as part of all of this. Uh, we want to uh, just take note of, of all of the people that were uh, uh, vaccinated. There was one very special person that we want to highlight the 100-year-old uh, veteran was vaccinated at the county center uh, through our Department of Emergency Services. It was done in concert with the New York State Department of Health, the county clerk's office, and the New York's Division of Military and Naval Affairs. Uh, a 100-year-old World War II veteran from Tuckahoe, James V. Papa, and Mr. Papa served his nation during uh, World War II. And now we serve Mr. Papa by trying to protect him so he can enjoy the beginnings of his second century here with us all. Uh, we worked out all of the little bureaucratic things that required him to get a shot. Uh, but I think there's a photograph here. You'll see uh, Mr. Papa uh, getting that life-saving uh, opportunity. His daughter, Tonya Gallows, sent us a very nice letter. But what she said in the letter that was most interesting to us, she said, I strongly urge anyone looking to protect themselves to get the vaccine. No better place than to put yourself in the hands of uh, the Westchester County COVID-19 vaccination program. Glad to have my dad back in Tuckahoe in Westchester County where he grew up and raised a family. So we're very thankful for the help we were given in getting him his first vaccine. And so once again, we want to thank you again, Mr. Papa, for your service to this nation. You risked your life for all of us many years ago, and now we want you to have as long and as fruitful a life as you can as we deal with this, uh, this COVID outbreak. Uh, we're going to touch on some non-COVID points, uh, and then we'll open up to any questions that we may have from the press. Um, one of the issues that you've seen a lot of uh, movement around with our federal representatives, our Congress members, and our United States senators is uh, the restoration of the state and local tax deduction, the SALT deduction, uh, which we lost two years ago when it was eliminated by uh, the former president and the former majorities in both houses. The, uh, the SALT deduction has become an important issue because it, it directly affects the economics of people who live in places like Westchester County, Nassau County, and elsewhere. It is double taxation. Very simply, a portion of your discretionary income that you receive is given to state and local governments. The state portion of it is withheld in the same way that your federal uh, taxes have a withholding element. You don't receive that money to spend it discretionarily. And for 100 years, since the imposition of an income tax, in 1917 it was, that uh, you were able to claim that as a deduction on your federal tax. That deduction was limited to a total of $10,000. And in that limitation, many people found themselves impacted dramatically. That was the single largest tax increase for an individual over the last period of time, larger than any municipal uh, t property tax increase. When you see, uh, you know, local government uh, raises a 2%, they stay within the tax cap. Oh, you raise my taxes. The single biggest tax increase was the loss of the SALT tax deduction. And it was done in a fashion that I think, frankly, uh, pitted one state against another. It, uh, it hurt those states, like New York, that provide robust local services. And I've used the example more than once. Here in the New York metropolitan area, that includes Connecticut and New Jersey, we have a mass transit system for which there is no equal and an essential to the economy of the New York metropolitan area that people, whether they're in northern New Jersey, Fairfield County, Long Island, or the northern suburbs can get in and out of Manhattan to work. There is no similar system in Houston, Texas, which is the fourth largest city in the country, or Dallas, which is the sixth largest city in the country. No mass transit that's comparable to what we do in New York. But our local taxes pay for that mass transit. It reduces pollution. 
and it aids the growth of businesses in this area. And so we wind up suffering by having to pay double taxation because we have local services like that. We've extended sewer treatment and sewerage pipes in areas like ours in a much greater degree than you have in other parts of the country where they still rely on you know, septic systems and septic fields to, to treat sewerage. When we have those kinds of systems, we improve the quality of our water our bodies like the Long Island Sound, the Hudson River, and the, and the Atlantic Ocean. And it is local tax dollars that go into those sewer systems. The city pays a certain portion of it, the county pays a significant portion of it, but you can't deduct that portion of your taxes off anymore. So there's efforts being made right now to uh, uh, repeal that uh, action that uh, took away the deduction, imposed the $10,000 cap. U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer has taken a leadership on it in the Senate. He's been ably assisted by our U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Uh, our three Congress members, Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones, and Sean Patrick Maloney, have all been uh, supportive of that. And, uh, and they understand that restoration of this deduction is not giving a benefit to wealthy people. It's helping middle class people that are homeowners that deal with the high property taxes and gets a chance to uh, reduce them. And I want to point out, you know, there's always a uh, you know, comment about how high our property taxes are in Westchester County. Uh, keep in mind that two-thirds of what you pay in property taxes generally goes to support your schools. And this year, New York State, uh, perhaps for the first time in a long time, made robust uh, uh, subsidy, as they should, for public schools to rely less on property taxation for it. We have cut in Westchester County, your Westchester County property taxes in the last two years. We've reduced the overall county property tax levy. But uh, it becomes a very flip thing to say as if uh, the mandates that come down from the state to the local governments isn't really at the core of what gives us our high property taxes. We have to pay in county government a portion of Medicaid costs, which no other state requires county governments to pay. Be that as it may, those are the rules of the game. We work through them to try to reduce property taxes. We've had some success in the last few years. Every local government struggles with that. They look for alternate sources of revenue that are not taxation revenues. And, uh, and in these things, when we, can, when we can restore the SALT deduction, we will give property taxpayers an important break through their federal income tax to offset some of the costs of paying for those services. We thank our federal representatives on this issue. I participated in a couple of press conferences. I think there'll be more um, as uh, various individuals around the area uh, want to point that out. I want to point out that uh, we have established some dates for openings of our various parks uh, and our recreational facilities, of which we're very proud of. And uh, we'll try to go through this in, in, in certain fashions. We are going to be opening, for weekend purposes, uh, two of our beaches, the Playland Beach and the Croton Point Park Beach. They will both open on Memorial Day weekend which would mean Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And they will stay open for weekends from that point through the month of June uh, until they open on a wider basis after June 25th. But we will open on Memorial Day weekend, Playland Beach, and Croton Point Park Beach. We'll let you know about Glen Island based on what I said earlier. If we get final authority and some good news, perhaps we can add Glen Island to that list. But right now, Playland and Croton Point, we're announcing, will open Memorial Day weekend for beachgoers to cool themselves off on weekends up until June 25th. On June 25th, June 26th, we will open up wider. We'll be open seven days a week at Playland Beach. So they will be open uh, every day of the week from June 25th until Labor Day. And Croton Point Beach will be open Wednesdays through Sundays from that June 25th day through Labor Day. So all throughout July and August, Croton Point Park Beach will be open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday throughout. Now we have four operative uh, public pools that Westchester County runs. Saxon Woods Pool in uh, White Plains, in the White Plains portion of the park. The park actually spans four communities. But Saxon Woods in White Plains, Sprain Ridge, which is uh, in Yonkers on the Yonkers-Greenberg border, Tibbetts Brook, which is in the heart of Yonkers, and Wilson Woods in Mount Vernon. And those pools will open seven days a week on the 25th of June. June 25th is opening day for our pools. That's still a little over two months away. Mark it on your calendar. Um, and then the, the Playland Pool, which is the fifth of our pools, has been closed for reconstruction. If you pass by it now, it's a place I pass by all the time. It's uh, completely under reconstruction. We've broken it through. It's going to be a completely new type of pool. Uh, that's going to go in its place. For those that may not follow this issue, this was quite a debate in the period of time before I became county executive. Board of Legislators agreed upon a plan to renovate it. Um, it has traditionally been 
the pool that was used for competition purposes, and the general sense was that the use of a pool next to an amusement park isn't really ideal for competition. It's really ideal for people that want to relax with the little children. The pool wasn't really constructed that way. So the pool that was renovated uh, two years ago at Sprain Ridge is now structured to be the competition pool for the major competition swim groups here in Westchester County. It has dimensions that are appropriate for competition. And the Playland pool will be a recreational pool when it reopens, uh, but it is under construction, so therefore it is not open for the year 2021. We have four pools open, and they all open on June 25th, and they will, uh, they will stay open seven days a week uh, through the summer and uh, into Labor Day period of time. Playland Amusement Park will also open in that same time frame on June 26th. It will stay open from June 26th until Labor Day weekend, and uh, during that period of time, it will be open Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, all throughout the months of July and August. It will be open on July 5th, a Monday, because that is the celebrated holiday for the, for the Independence Day weekend, and also on September 6th, which is the Labor Day holiday the Labor Day weekend, so those two Mondays, Wednesday through Sunday. This is a this is a smaller amount of time. We usually would open in mid-May. This in this case, we're opening in late June, and we're closed an extra day a week. Mondays have traditionally been a day of closure. Tuesday now will also be closed. At at Playland, at the pools, and at the beaches, we have to go through a much more elaborate protocol than we have in past years. People have asked me, uh, you know, how come it's not open as much? It's going to take a lot more manpower to sanitize facilities. You can imagine in an amusement park where there are all sorts of rides happening and there's a midway. We're gonna to have to come up with structures to manage social distancing inside an amusement park. And we're also going to have to uh, uh, take care of the manpower requirements in order to run the park effectively. Much, much more people, many more people will be needed to manage that function. Last year, when we opened the pools and the beaches, we were able to rise to the occasion and accomplish that. I compliment the Parks Department for that. They did yeoman's work, so we're going to do that again, and we're going to add Playland to it, and keep your fingers crossed if we can add Glen Island to that as well. But we are trying very hard to move in the right direction, and uh, probably either later this week or next week, we'll announce the official opening date for Bicycle Sundays, which usually come up the first weekend in May. We'll confirm that date, and we'll make an announcement for everybody. All of these things are happening because we have a reduction in the amount of infection, we have a rise in the amount of vaccinations, and we believe we can do these things safely and carefully. If for any reason we see an increase in spread that's significant, we will shut any one or more of these facilities down. Not because we want to, but because we will put the safety of residents first. But we also recognize that these recreational facilities are essential to the quality of life and to the mental health of individuals who you know, can stay quarantined and cooped up only so long as we're now into the second year of this uh, fight of this pandemic. So it is a balancing act. We think we found the right balance we did last year. We hope that'll be true this year. And so uh, that's the announcements in terms of opening our pools, our beaches, and Playland Park as well. And we're hopeful that we'll have a very good summer, that this summer will be better than last summer. We'll be able to do more things as the higher number of vaccinations, lower number of infections continues to go. I want to handle one more issue of parks, which we talked about last week. We've had some discussion. It'll take a few seconds to cover, but that's the issue that's really uh, peaked up in the last 10 days or so, and that is disc golf. Disc golf, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it is playing a, uh, a it's a recreation and a competition that imitates what happens when you play golf. In golf, you hit a ball, 18 holes, you put in a hole, number of strokes, lowest number of strokes, you win the competition. In disc golf, you take a disc, a frisbee, and you throw it from a tee box, and the number of throws that it takes for you to put it in a basket at the end of the hole mirrors the number of strokes it takes for you to finish uh, a hole of golf. And after 18 holes of competition, you have played a round of disc golf. Disc golf was uh, added to the budget by the Board of Legislators, $40,000 allocation in the budget for 2020, which was approved in 2019. This was a matter of public record at the time. Most people don't follow these budgets very closely. There was no particular debate over it. There was no particular controversy over it. Nobody said, oh, wait a minute, this is disc golf. We don't want to know about this. So uh, as with, with 1,000 issues that we have, uh, it passed in the budget, and then we moved forward to implement it. 
Uh, I asked the, uh, the county parks department to analyze the sport and come back with a game plan about where we would uh, implement it in our park system. We have 55 parks around the county. Some are dedicated passive parks. Our six nature preserves, we have waterfront and, and uh, swamp area type parks. We have some other ones that are committed to active recreation and uh, it just depends. I've mentioned already we've got uh, four, ultimately five pools in our system and we have beaches, we have uh, uh, mountain biking at some parks, we have obviously golf, six golf courses, regular, go regular golf courses, and there's a host of different activities that we have along those lines. We have picnicking and plenty of things. Certain things are targeted for passive, uh, walking, trails, and so forth. Some of them are active, and some of them are amalgam of the two. Um, so the Parks Department analyzed, looked at uh, this area of Saxon Woods, the southern area of Saxon Woods, as a possible place for disc golf. They uh, contracted, they had two proposals, they picked one proposal for a designer who went out to try to lay out what a course would look like. While they were laying it out and doing a report, which had not yet been received by the Parks Department nor by senior management, uh, individuals saw that there was some sort of a marking out there and assumed that something was afoot. And then there was uh, a podcast done by some of the folks who support the concept of, uh, of uh, disc golf. And the podcast itself, frankly, was inaccurate, said a lot of things that would make the listener believe that there was some behind the scenes deal and there was some uh, you know, inappropriate actions that led to this disc golf. When in fact, the initial discussion and budgeting for this was all done out in the open. However, uh, issues uh, advance getting you know, concrete information. So while the plan was being put together for review by parks management or by senior management, uh, there was a, an anonymous flyer put out saying, you'd better stop this, rise up, they're gonna sneak this past you. Uh, and of course, it enriled a lot of people. And a week ago, I addressed some of the inaccuracies of both the podcast, which were proponents of disc golf, and the opponents, which were in the anonymous flyer. They talked about clear-cutting trees that was never part of the discussion, is not part of the discussion. They talked about uh, a host of other different things that uh, were asserted as truth, which were not truth. I addressed those a week ago, but what I did say is we would look at the designer's proposal and then we would make a decision on it. So we, I saw the designer's proposal last Friday and I thought it was ob obtrusive for the, for the area set aside. And after talking to senior management, Ken, Joan McDonald, some others, and the leadership of the Parks Department, I have told them to cease efforts to uh, try to place this in Saxon Woods, that the area set aside for this in my judgment, would not properly accommodate the 18 holes that Disc Golf wants, and that we should resurvey the various other sites that we have in the county as a possible home for Disc Golf, but not Saxon Woods. So that decision just made on Friday over the weekend, I announced to you now, all of those who are concerned that it would be in Saxon Woods can relax, it will not be in Saxon Woods. For those of you who want Disc Golf, understand that I believe it's a, it is a val valid recreation, and that it can be part of our county mix. So what we're going to do is survey other locations to determine where disc golf would work perhaps better. And rather than uh, talk about something that's still in an, in an analysis process, when and if we have a proposed location for it and how it would be laid out, we will then publicly announce it, just in the same way that I'm doing this now. So there's none of this behind the scenes stuff and fear. Um, uh, I will, I have spoken to Henry Neal, who is the chair of the Parks Board, and I've indicated to him that I would like for his Parks Board to have a general discussion about disc golf as an appropriate or not an appropriate recreation so that uh, we understand that this is merely a question of finding the right place for the right kind of activity. We have mountain biking in three of our parks. A person who is accustomed to walking on a path without a mountain bike would find a mountain biker uh, uh, you know, objectionable to, to share the same area. But in three of our parks, we have designated them for that purpose. And we have different purposes structured in different parks. Uh, so we will see how that all plays out. For those who are disc golf enthusiasts, uh, your case is not lost. There will be a discussion about what might be a proper place. We're also going to talk with the state about it. The state has, has a disc golf facility at the FDR Park in uh, Yorktown, and there's some discussions about the state looking at state park land for this purpose. Either way, if it expands the sport of disc golf or the recreation of disc golf would be appropriate. Some people who wrote to me were very upset over us even discussing the idea of this kind of an active recreation. And I've said to them, whether we put it in Saxon Woods or not, which we are not going to do, um, 
parks have different reasons and uses for different people. And I have to push back at people who want to see nothing but passive use of our parks. Our woodlands are important to protect, and we protect in the marshlands, at the Reed Sanctuary, at Trailside, at Nature, um, uh, Nature Woods, Cranberry Lake, at uh, Lenoir Preserve, where I was today. We, we reserve areas for no active recreation at all. But for some people, active recreation is part of what uh, they want. And that's why we do have six golf courses, and that's why we do have baseball fields at Macy Field in Greenberg, <clears throat> and we have other uses at other parks. So uh, this is why the Parks Board's uh, challenge, as citizens that are appointed to the Parks Board, to look at the overall structure of our parks and the overall recreational needs of our people and to try to create some balance so that we have all of these things in some reasonable proportion. So uh, that is the update that I promised you a week ago. Uh, we have not uh, done anything outside of the norm of normal decision making. I took some umbrage at some of the accusations that were made by people. We now have a, a new world of social media where anybody can get onto Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, say whatever they like. Uh, it doesn't have to be proven as uh, normal press has to be proven. A person can express an opinion, uh, hearsay, whatever they think it is, and they can be absolutely sure. And when it circulates around, uh, you wind up chasing a rumor. You wind up chasing this person to that person, what was said, and people repeat that rumor whether they know it's true or not. And I'm sure that this dialogue today will not automatically be heard by every person that has that. So I would suggest share with your, share with your friends if, you've hear, if you hear this with other people that you know are interested about the issue and what the county has done. The county has decided not to pursue disc golf at Saxon Woods. We are looking around the park system to determine where it might be placed elsewhere. And if, in fact, we do settle on another place and a design, there will be a public uh, dialogue about it so that no one can feel that anything has been done untoward. Uh, hopefully that, uh, that puts to rest some people's concerns. And for those who want to see disc golf, this is not the ending of your opportunity. This is a restructuring of it as we look to see what might be a more appropriate area. You do need a lot of land to do this sport, to do it properly. And uh, we want to be sure that we have sufficient land to do that in a way that doesn't interrupt with other existing uses at the facility. And we have a lot of land. We have a lot of acreage. We'll see just how we can do that. So uh, with all that news, a lot of news about parks as well as a lot of news about COVID, we'll check with Catherine Chaffee, who's our Director of Communications, to see what questions we have from the press. So the first question comes from David Proper from the Journal News. He asks, as a partner with the state, with appointments easier to come by and demand decreasing, should the county center in the uh, near future become a walk-in without needing an appointment? The discussion, uh, David Proper from uh, the Journal News, uh, The state will make the determination if they will move off of the appointment model to the uh, walk-in model. Uh, I suspect that's not going to happen in the short term, meaning the balance of this month, perhaps the first part of May. We are approaching the point of uh, greater uh, supply than demand, but we're not at that point yet. I'm sure that's part of the discussion that the state is having, but it's not just about the county center facility. It's about the Jacob Javits facility. Uh, the facility, I believe, is one of the Carrier Dome in Syracuse and Potsdam, which I read about in the Journal News and the weekly uh, edition of it, uh, and in a number of other locations, Aqueduct and so forth. So if the state decides to make that transition, Obviously, we hope that they will announce it far enough in advance to then open it up for, in essence, first come, first serve. If we're sure that everybody who's the most vulnerable have gotten their shots, then first come, first serve is fine. First come, first serve would not have made sense at the beginning of this process because those that had the greatest facility with computers, those who were healthy enough to get in the car and go wherever they had to go, would beat out those people that might be more vulnerable but less able to interact with the system. Uh, but I think, David, that day may be coming, but, uh, but we won't know that until the state makes that decision. And of course, the county will track that decision. And if we reach the point at which we now have to uh, hunt out those people to take vaccines, then we may transition to that. But we're not there yet. Okay. And the next question, which is also the final question, comes from Samantha Crawford from News 12 Westchester. She asks, how high is vaccine hesitancy in our minority communities? Has it improved as the county has released educational videos and done outreach? Uh, Samantha Crawford from News 12 offered that question. I think we saw a reduction in uh, vaccine hesitancy over the last uh, month and a half. And I think it stems from a number of different situations part of which is the more broad base of people that had taken the vaccine and after you know, a 24 hour, 48 hour period after the vaccine uh, proved to be healthy, no uh, particularly bad reactions to it. People who were hesitant saw that. 
I think we saw a lot of prominent individuals speak on behalf of having a vaccine, people who have credibility in the various uh, communities of color, uh, communities where there are people who are poor and, and less willing to take the vaccine. <coughs> Uh, and I think we started to see a, a vaccine uh, hesitancy percentage drop. This is very generic, Samantha. We don't have hard numbers that would tell us that. We would have to, uh, we would have to contract a professional polling agency to poll and get a representative sample to give a scientific answer. However, uh, as, as Ken pointed out in his uh, up portion of the update, the Johnson & Johnson pause has generated some additional vaccine hesitancy. And I think what happens is all of us as Americans um, you know, don't necessarily want to take the time and effort to really understand the details of something. We get the headline of something. And when Johnson & Johnson has been paused for very specific reasons as they analyze six cases out of six and a half million uh, people who are vaccinated, the, the reaction is, in my judgment, an overreaction. It is a fear, oh my God, it's no good. We can't use it. They're all like that. If you have read anything about this, even from a layman's standpoint, the, the structure of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are different from the structure of the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca product, which is uh, in use in Europe, not yet authorized in the United States. And um, as they look to see, was the Johnson & Johnson vaccine distribution to these six individuals, did that cause the situation, or was it a combination of other things that caused it, which would then become a, uh, an advisory to individuals, if you have these situations, then don't do this, as opposed to intrinsically anybody could be impacted by it. That's the details that most people haven't read. So if you have a natural disposition that says, I don't like getting stuck by needles, that's pretty universal. I don't think many people jump to be vaccinated. Then you get into the, the thought that uh, this is uh, science that has not been mature. We haven't had years of this vaccine where everybody has a, a sort of a sense, oh yeah, I've been doing this for 10, 20 years and there's been no problem with it. And I think that raises the vaccine hesitancy. So we're going through what I would hope would be a blip of additional vaccine hesitancy, which I think over the extended period of time should be reduced again. We will see how they respond to the J&J &J pause and, uh, and then also our promotional outreach to try to reach those people who are hesitant but can, be, can have their concerns addressed uh, in an intelligent way and persuaded in an intelligent way. There are some people who won't take the vaccine for other reasons that will be hard to get at. You cannot deny that for some people there's an ideological reason not to do this. There are some people who just have very strong feelings about vaccinations of any sort and that's not movable with any uh, campaign of any sort. And the question is how large is that absolute cohort that won't take it and how many of the people that are hesitant to take it under the right set of circumstances would feel comfortable? The, the ultimate question is, how do you rate risk? How do you rate risk? If you see that one person out of 6.5, uh, one out of 1 million, 1.5 million has had a negative reaction, I mean, there's a risk there. No one can deny there's a risk. One out of so many. When you realize that um, uh, 2,200 people in Westchester County have died from COVID. That number is far in excess over whatever the risk is of the vaccine, if you want to do a mathematical. But it, 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 it is up to the individual to assess that risk in their own mind. How vulnerable do they feel to COVID? And if they feel vulnerable enough, then they, they take the step and do it. Uh, I've had my two vaccines. I've gone my two weeks since the second shot. I feel fine. I actually felt very good after the second shot, which is surprising to me. So many people have had a negative reaction, but I didn't know. And I wasn't exactly, you know, happy to take a vaccine. I took it because it was the prudent thing to do, given my age and so forth. Um, and people have to come to that judgment. And it's hard to do that in a society when you don't read details of things. You just get the headline and when you talk to somebody else or you go on the internet. And on the internet, you will find people that will hold exact uh, uh, opposite positions on any issue, and they will argue it passionately, and you tend to go toward the position that you were predisposed to. And you say, see, well, look at those arguments, because those are the arguments that I want to be true. But um, COVID is a serious disease. Many people have minimized it over the course of the last year. Uh, we've all had, I don't know if we all have, but I certainly have had people that I know, that I care deeply about, who have died from COVID. The, the, the nature of their death was alone, it was lonely, it was a painful death by everything I understand to be true. In some cases, that death came to a person well before the natural time that you would have expected them to pass away. Um, when you see that happen, you don't want to see that happen to one other person. 
I, when I give you the statistics on death, you know, we have 12 this week, it's less than 19 last week, that's good. There's nothing good about 12 people who will love to die. You have to ask yourself, how do you assess that risk in your own life? And how do you assess that risk for the people that you love? And are you prepared to take the dice and roll it and say, you know what, I don't think it'll affect me. I'm not worried about it. Maybe so. You might be a carrier and deliver it to somebody else. You don't know. None of us really do know. But you have to make that risk assessment. But I would argue that uh, there's a lot of foolishness going on in this country right now. A lot of people who are willfully believing what they want to believe instead of what objective facts lead them to believe. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to persuade enough Americans that we do reach herd immunity, we will get ourselves through this pandemic, and then I think uh, the mayor and I will go out and have lunch once again with Mr. Uh, Jenkins. We'll find a similar restaurant that we once had lunch in. We'll go back again. We won't have masks on, and we'll talk about how we survived this. But we haven't survived it yet. There's no time for us to write a book. We'll find out in due time uh, just how we get out of all of this, and uh, we will get out of it. So thank you, Samantha, for your question. Thank you, David, for your question. If there's any other members of the press have any other questions, they can direct it to Catherine Chaffee. We'll be happy to answer it offline. Uh, we will be back on Thursday at 2 o'clock to give the, uh, the end of the week update. The numbers have been steadily dropping. If that continues, uh, the news will be better still, and uh, we get closer to normal. In the meantime, be safe. Thank you for watching. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Have a good day.